How do SGLT2 inhibitors cause euglycemic DKA? This is kind of a continuation of a video series I've been doing exploring SGLT2 inhibitors. And this question was actually asked by my brother, Jing, where he said, can you talk about the mechanism of euglycemic DKA? It's one of the main issues we deal with in the ED regarding these meds. So thank you, Jing, for asking this question. And I did have to kind of look up the mechanism and try and figure this out. And it's kind of difficult to say because the answer is both on the one hand, simple in some regards and complicated. And so just delving into the simple uh, part first, the main reason that SGLT2 inhibitors can cause DKA with a normal glucose level uh, is kind of three different things. So the first one is that their mechanism obviously is uh, by inducing glucosuria, so excretion of glucose in the urine. And this helps the patient maintain a degree of normal glycemia. So if they're experiencing DKA, they're also just spilling out a ton more glucose than they would otherwise. And so that's why their sugars can be relatively normal. The other thing that I found in a lot of articles is that it alters and kind of decreases this insulin to glucagon ratio. And this leads to a uh, propensity towards lipolysis. And lipolysis is the breakdown of fats. And then you undergo ketogenesis, which end up, ends up causing DKA. So this decreased ratio kind of predisposes them to going into DKA. And then finally, there are some articles that suggest that there is increased renal reabsorption of ketones when patients are on SGLT2 inhibitors. And so this uh, may also contribute to ketoacidosis. So yeah, if somebody just wanted a simple explanation, I would really just say, you know, it's the glucose lowering effect of the SGLT2 inhibitors by excreting it in the, glu the urine. And then also there's some hormonal changes with the insulin and glucagon and increased absorption of ketones. But uh, obviously there's a whole complicated mechanism at play as well that really kind of explains this all a little bit better. And I also thought it was a really great opportunity to review the normal mechanism of DK, which I needed to review as well. And it kind of helps you understand why all these shifts actually cause uh, euglycemic DK. In normal DK, which typically happens in type 1 diabetics, uh, there is a baseline insulin deficiency. Uh, and this can get worsened in states of stress. So, for example, infections, or maybe they forgot to give themselves insulin, or even just physiologic or psychological stressors can also cause this relative insulin deficiency. So this is what kind of kicks everything off. And so now, uh, let's say you have some cells lying around and they're hungry and they want to get some glucose and you have a bunch of glucose going in your bloodstream like this. Normally, the insulin would help them go into the cells and then the cells would be, be able to create ATP. But the problem is when you have this insulin de deficiency, now you're blocking this and they're no longer able to go in. So now you still have all this glucose in your bloodstream but your cells didn't see any of it. And so what they end up doing is they start releasing what are called counter-regulatory hormones because they're basically asking for uh, more glucose to be sent to them. And this includes things like glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol, and growth hormone. And so now I'm going to draw a picture of your liver here. Uh, but what the liver is going to do in response to these counter-regulatory hormones is it's going to start undergoing glycogenolysis. So remember the liver stores energy in the form of glycogen. And so this is going to go out into the bloodstream to help increase the glucose levels. And then you're also going to take some non-glycogen substrates such as proteins and lipids and turn that uh, into glucose as well via the process of gluconeogenesis. And so again, that's going to increase your glucose as well. And so what happens is the levels of glucose in your blood just continue to get higher and higher and higher, but no, your cells are still not seeing any of this. And this actually ends up leading to that osmotic diuresis. So your kidneys start seeing these huge amounts of uh, glucose and they can't reabsorb all of it in the proximal convoluted tubule. So they end up just peeing it all out and you get this osmotic diuresis, you get dehydration. And this is what also causes the polyuria and polydipsia that you see in DKA as well. So besides all this, uh, you also have adipocytes, and I'm going to draw them here. So these are your fat cells, the adipocytes, and they are also going to be hungry because they're going to say, hey, I'm not getting any glucose either. What's the deal? So again, all this glucose out in the bloodstream, but none of it is able to get in, and it's just not 
uh, just kind of hanging out and getting stuck in the blood. So all of the triglycerides that are in the adipocytes, they're going to start actually uh, breaking all of that down in the process of lipolysis. And lipolysis is when you break down triglycerides into uh, free fatty acids and glycerol. The free fatty acids then go back to the liver where they undergo beta oxidation, which is when the free fatty acids break down into acetyl-CoA. Normally this would go to the Krebs cycle, but because you have so much acetyl-CoA, this ends up further going uh, ketogenesis. It gets shifted down to another pathway instead and uh, becomes all of the ketones that you see, the ketone bodies like acetone, which is responsible for that sweet breath smell, uh, acetoacetate, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And that's the one that we typically test for when we're looking for a patient uh, in DKA. These ketone bodies are highly acidic, which is why you get the ketoacidosis component of DKA. So now let's say we have a patient with type 2 diabetes and we throw in an SGLT2 inhibitor into the mix. So even at baseline, there are some effects that they've seen that shows that it decreases uh, insulin levels in patients and also increases glucagon, which is why they're talking about uh, the decreased insulin to glucagon ratio, which kind of leads you to have a predisposition for lipolysis. And remember that if you have this relative insulin deficiency, then during states of stress, you may not be able to get that glucose into the cells, and then they're going to release all these counter-regulatory hormones, one of which includes glucagon. Furthermore, because of the glucoseurea component of the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, you are actually going to be getting rid of a lot of this glucose that is built up in, in the bloodstream. So again, the glucagon is activated now. It's causing glycogenolysis, gluconeogenesis, increasing the glucose everywhere. None of uh, the cells are able to pull in the glucose. Uh, but because you're just spilling out so much glucose in the urine, you're actually going to maintain a relative degree of normal glycemia. Uh, and then furthermore, because you have increased renal absorption of ketones, then you have an easier predisposition to getting DKA as well. So yeah, hopefully all of that made sense. And I'm just going to show you a couple of graphics to uh, kind of demonstrate uh, this process. So uh, this is a graphic uh, where there's an SGLT2 inhibitor. You can see that at baseline, there's less insulin and more glucagon. And you're also getting more glucoseurea. So now in this part down here, the patient is going into euglycemic DKA. So you can see the whole event was kind of spurred by this intercurrent illness slash metabolic stress, such as surgery, infection, decreased PO intake or GI losses. And then this combination is increasing the counter-regulatory hormones. Because again, you have this imbalance at baseline, and then you got the stressor. And so now you have that relative insulin deficiency that we were talking about earlier. So now the adipocytes, they're not pulling in that glucose anymore. So they're going to start undergoing lipolysis uh, because of that insulin deficiency. And you get the free fatty acids delivered to the liver. They get converted to acetyl-CoA, and then they cannot undergo Krebs cycle because there's too much. So they under undergo ketogenesis instead, and they make all of those ketone bodies, and you get into diabetic ketoacidosis. At the same time, however, all those mechanisms that were causing elevated glucose in your blood, like gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, they're being counteracted still by this glucoseurea, which is pretty significant when you're a patient's on SGLT2 inhibitors. So this is maintaining the euglycemia. And this combination is why, A, the patients are prone to getting euglycemic DK, even though they're a type 2 diabetic, and B, why they're euglycemic, uh, even in the setting of DK. There's actually a fairly robust amount of literature that I was able to find uh, that kind of went over all of this uh, in terms of the mechanism. So again, here you can see the pathophysiology of euglycemic DKA with SGLT2 inhibitors involves the lowering of insulin and increasing of glucagon, which promotes a shift of glucose to fat me metabolism and stimulating uh, ketogenesis. You also increase urinary glucose excretion, which keeps the sugar levels down, but also further reduces insulin secretion from beta cells. And then here they also talk about the renal reabsorption of ketones as well, which may be playing a role. In this study, they looked at type 2 diabetes patients on an SGLT2 inhibitors, and their plasma glucose levels were 20 to 25 milligrams per deciliter less than control patients. And they said, as glucose is the chief stimulus for insulin release under all circumstances, plasma insulin levels also fell pretty dramatically. And plasma glucagon concentrations increased significantly as well. As a consequence, the calculated insulin to glucagon concentration ratio dropped from 9 to 7 moles per mole 
And uh, this releases inhibition of gluconeogenesis in the liver. Uh, and then finally, they said, more importantly, renal glucose clearance uh, via glucoseurea is twice as large with euglycemic DKA than with DKA. So again, it's very significant how much glucose they're peeing out. Anyways, that was a bit of a roundabout way to explain why SGLT2 inhibitors can cause euglycemic DKA. As I said, there was kind of a simple answer and a more complicated answer. But I feel like having that review of DKA, which I did have to you know, review all the mechanisms, it did really help me understand what they were talking about, you know, about how the glucoseurea is really helping maintain that normal glycemia, and then why the insulin glucagon ratio is so important. And overall, it just really helps you figure out why, you know, these type 2 diabetes patients on SGLT2 inhibitors have that relative insulin deficiency that is predisposing them to going into DKA as well. Anyways, I hope that helped. I think I'll have to get to the edit to see if everything still made sense or not, but I'm probably just going to post it anyway. And so let me know down in the comments below if you found it helpful. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.